Hello everyone, I'm Ofa and we're going to discuss today a case of stress during incontinence. I have four lovely volunteers who each of them is going to do part of the case scenario. So let's come and see our case scenario. You're the ST5 running the urogynecology clinic alongside your consultant. You're about to see a patient whose referral letter is enclosed. Would you be kind enough to see this patient with symptoms of urinary incontinence? She has had the symptoms for the past eight months. You're sincerely the name of the doctor. So in this scenario, Asya, Pasi and Aditi, each of them would be doing a part. Asya would be taking comprehensive urogyna history. Hasina would be examining, investigating, explaining the diagnosis, which is stress urinary incontinence. DT will be talking about the management plan for the patient. So let's start with Asya first and see how she starts with the introduction and the history. Amanda, can you tell me more about your problem? Mm -hmm. Since when it started, do you wet yourself when you don't want? Is this uh, wetting all the time or it is related to some activities? It is with exercise and coughing. Um, and uh, do you have to use the pad? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, do you have to rush to the toilet to pee? Do you wet yourself while you are on the way to the toilet? Is there any problem while initiating the um, stream of urine? any dribbling after you finished passing urine? Is there any pain while passing the urine or any blood? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, what about uh, how many times you have to pass uh, go to the toilet to pee? Mm -hmm. Do you have to get up in the night to pee? Can you tell me about your fluid intake habit? How many times you are taking fluid and what type of the fluid? How's your bowel opening? Mm -hmm. Do you notice any lump below down? Okay. Is it affecting the way you want to live your life? I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, I want to ask some, uh, like, uh, are you updated with your cervical smear? Mm -hmm. And uh, have you ever been pregnant before? How you deliver? Uh, is there any problem during delivery? Any instruments used? Do you remember the weight of the babies? Mm -hmm. And how is the recovery after each delivery? Good, nice to hear. And uh, as a part of my job to assess your sexual health, maybe you feel some question personal, intrusive, may I ask? Are you in a relationship with someone? Mm -hmm. And uh, is there any problem with the sex? Do you leak or wet uh, while during sex? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sorry to hear about that. When you have your last period, have you start uh, taking any hormone replacement therapy? Okay. Otherwise, you're fit and well. Any surgery in your tummy, you are below down. Any medication you are taking, allergic to something. What you do for your living, and how is the job? Any stress, or what type of job? Mm -hmm. Do you have support at home? To whom you are living with? Do you smoke, drink alcohol, any recreational drugs, anything in your family you want to share? Uh, thank you for sharing information. Do you want to add anything? No, I want to examine you in the Okay. So, Asya, well done. You did really good. Your history was a perfect urine history. You even made it in three minutes. But actually in the exam, you'll have like, a, I think 30 seconds total or less than that, because the patient in between will be answering your question. So th there will be that pause between each question and the other. But the good thing is that I wrote down here some points. You were really systematic in your history. That's important. You had a blend of open-ended questions, closed-ended questions. You also demonstrate that you're actively listening. So I realized that in some of the questions you did recap a little bit you said okay all right and you did react to the effect on quality of life when you asked her that question and like I said you were using lay language your the, the language you're using in your questions was very clear it was very clearly understandable by the patient 
and you did thank her for the history at the end and i just want to recap some important points that asia covered first of all she didn't know what type of incontinence so her first question was to establish or the first three or four questions were to establish what type of incontinence she has the effect on the quality of life because a woman wetting herself it's distressing it's not easy on her okay and also she inquired if she's using any pads because if she's not then you would offer it to her as part of a management plan until the treatment starts to work or until she waits to have definitive treatment if she's going to have surgery she also um inquired about i wrote it down here yes symptoms of prolapse because 50% of women with stress incontinence do have prolapse as well then that would change the treatment later on won't it and she did ask about social history and support because she's 55 years old she may be living in a nursing home or an elderly home you never know so you do want to make sure that she has adequate support especially later on when she's about to have surgery i just have a few points um i said that i wanted to comment on they won't take away from you any marks but you there will be any harm if you do improve on them don't you so you did inquire about the past of sexual history okay i understand why you asked about that the weight of the baby but recovery after delivery no need she's 55 years old this problem is not related to any problems with recovery or problems in in the pregnancy itself you just want to know about the mode of delivery and that's it and the weight of the babies that can just waste time from you in the exam and nothing else and you after you finished from the whole urogyne history you then went to the gynecological history asked about smears you went to um past obstetrical history sexual and then again you went back up again and inquired about her lmp and use of hrt and that's considered part of gynecological history and if you do it once a mistake like that they won't get, take it against you but if you do it a lot the examiner would think that you're not being systematic at all and that can take a lot of marks from you and in information gathering so a mistake like this like i said won't do anything but just pay attention to it all right so let's go to um hasina so let me open now i want to examine in the presence of a chaperone I my nurse will take your past blood pressure and also want to calculate your hydrate ratio to see general condition then i will examine your tummy to see whether there is an alarm or scarred area and also i examine your down below to see the strength of the muscles of your down below then i will ask you to cough to see whether there is any leakage of urine then i uh, will introduce a small speculum very gently inside your vagina to open up the vagina to see whether there is any other pathology okay uh, then I will advise you to do some tests. One is urine routine microscopy and culture to rule out urine infection and also a blood sugar level test to rule out diabetes. And then I will advise you to maintain a blood diet to see how much fluid you have intake and how much urine you have passed in 24 hours and number of episodes of leakage in 24 hours and this will help uh, us to confirm your diagnosis. Okay. So from a history examination and investigation, what I can understand that you are having a condition called urinary stress incontinence. Do you have any idea about it? It is a condition in which urine leaks out or when your bladder is put under pressure like coughing, sneezing, laughing, doing heavy exercise. The exact cause is not known. Let me draw a picture for you. This is your bladder and this is your water pipe. Normally the bladder and this connecting pipe are kept in position by ligaments and muscles around the bladder, vagina and the back passage. When this supporting structure are damaged or weakened uh, due to difficult childbirth, delivery of big baby or increased tummy pressure due to overweight or sometimes due to uh, any operation in your lower tummy or some neurological disease, then this angle between the bladder and water pipe become lost and uh, the lower part of the bladder water pipe sometimes become more mobile and this is responsible for the accidental leakage of urine am i clear so far any question do you have okay well done Hasin. it was really good it was excellent and you managed to finish in how many let me check how much time two minutes examination investigations and explaining the diagnosis to a patient so well done um 
So the points, I just wrote down here some important points that Hasina did mention and it's important for all of you to know about it because these points not only are applicable on urogyny but any other case scenario. You, Whenever you're in a clinic, you have a nurse chaperon if it's a gynae clinic or a midwife chaperon if it's um, an antenatal clinic or postnatal clinic. So when you're about to examine the patient, you would offer her a chaperon. The nurse would or the midwife would prepare everything for you, undress the patient, and then you would come and examine and she would be there, okay, chaperoning you. So you tell the patient in the presence of a chaperon, I would want to do this, 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 and this. And usually the nurse or the midwife does the vital signs, the weights, the height, the BMI, and you go and do the abdominal and vaginal examination. So Hasina did uh, mention abdominal examination nicely, simple explanation, vaginal examination as well in a very nice, simplified way. When she came to investigations, she ordered the correct investigations, which are urine dipstick, random blood sugar. But remember, random blood sugar you order if the patient has um, frequency. Okay, if she doesn't have frequency, you don't need to order for it. And she talked about bladder dive as well. And for the urine um, dipstick, she said urine microscopy and, and culture. I don't think the patient would really want to know about all of these details. So you can just tell her that a better way that we'll just need to take a sample of your urine to test it for any infections, right? So that's the aim of why you're taking the urine sample. She doesn't care about the detail, how you are going to check for the infection. Okay, it's just the sample and the reason. Um, and then the last thing Hasina did nicely was explain the diagnosis. And most importantly, she did relate the explanation of the stress incontinence with the leak. So at the end, she said, that's why you wet yourself or you leak when you cough or exercise. Okay, so well done, Hasina. Excellent. Let's go now to the management plan. And I have given Diti some instructions. I told her that her BMI is... Um, let me see here. Her BMI is 32 and uh, she's confirmed to have stress urine incontinence. She doesn't like to be commented about on her weight. Okay. Um, she gets aggressive or angry and she's supposed to talk to her about the management plan. So take it on from after the diagnosis were explained to her going on until she ends the consultation till the end. So let's come in here, Diti. Please call me DT. Um, I see that you have been seen by my colleague earlier and investigated and diagnosed with stress urinary incontinence. Am I right? And you're here to discuss the management options. Uh, well, um, uh, before I do that, I would like to ask you a few questions because this is the first time I'm seeing you. I would like to know if you are following your GP for any medical conditions like chronic cough or heart disease and you suffer from any constipation. Um, what about your um, habits? Do you smoke? Mm -hmm. How many cigarettes per day? Okay. And uh, what about caffeinated drinks? How many do you consume per day? Okay. Thank you share, for sharing this information with me. What I will be uh, doing is I will discuss the management options with you at the end of the day. Uh, give your patient information with and also write back to your GP. How does it sound? Okay. Coming to the management. Um, uh, we have uh, medical uh, conservation methods and the surgical methods. Uh, well, I'll be giving you a lot of information, so at any point, if you want to stop me, please feel free to stop me and ask me questions. Coming to the conservative uh, method, first thing is, uh, I will be referring you to a physical therapist so that we will teach you something called as supervised pelvic floor muscle exercises. Mainly, uh, we have these muscles uh, around the bladder, water pipe, and the womb with support aid. So, by doing these muscles, we will strengthen the muscles in order so that they can hold the water pipe better, which will prevent the leakage. Uh, what you'll be taught in this is you will have to lift your uh, muscles in an inward way. Like if you want to go to the washroom urgently, but it is, one is not available nearby, the way you will try to hold it, that is what you have to do. You will do the three sets per day 
each set consisting of at least eight moments. Okay, and you need to do them for three months to have a good effect. Are you clear so far? Okay. So coming to the lifestyle modifications, I see that um, you really need to change your smoking habit. In fact, you need to cut off on your uh, cigarettes completely. For which I will be referring you to a major stop smoking uh, program. And also, uh, you need to reduce your caffeinated drinks because they actually cause a lot of irritation to the bladder and the uh, water bag. Mm, okay. Uh, and then if I look at your height to weight ratio, it is slowly on the higher side. I have, I also know that uh, you do not want to talk about it, but let me tell you the advantage of reducing your height to weight ratio. Even with a five percent reduction, uh, your symptoms will really improve. Okay, so uh, why is it that you do not want to talk about it? Did you have any bad experience with her? I'm really sorry that you have to go through. Yeah. But what I'll be doing is I would like to refer you to a dietitian and they will definitely guide you better. Okay, I'm at clear so far. With these two changes, if you try for three months, um, and if the symptoms improve, that's really good. But in case they don't improve, we will have to consider surgical options. Mainly the surgery aims at lifting up the bladder and um, a water pipe. In the pelvic suspension, there is this technique wherein the bladder is lifted up using either a, 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 a mesh like a, a structure or by using your own muscle. Another one we have is that of um, vaginal um, mesh uh, and the tape procedures. Um, and then uh, there is another injection which can be given into your uh, water pipe which can uh, thicken it and do the leakage, for which we will be referring you to a urologist, they will elaborate on it uh, better. Um, yes, there is a drug, but that is definitely not the first thing we will uh, give any patient. Uh, it is called as duoxetine. It may be acts by contracting the muscles around the uh, water pipe and prevent the leakage. It takes around three to four weeks for it to um, get into action. And some of the side effects are that of dry mouth and uh, mood swings and uh, constipation. So if, if, the, if these uh, symptoms are uh, too high, we can reduce the uh, dose. Okay, Amanda, I'll be giving you a appointment with my consultant as well. Thank you. Okay. Did you well done? You did really good. Um, but I just have a few comments. You took, let me see, you took around four minutes and 43 seconds. I told you to take around four and a half minutes. So you were able to do that, but there was some information missing. And at the same time, you mentioned information that's not needed. I didn't want you to take history or introduce yourself or um, mention an agenda, okay? For what you're, you're going to do. And when I timed you, all of that took one minute. What I wanted you to do is just take it on from when she was explained what she has and go on further. And that would be enough time for you to finish. The good things that you did that I really liked is that you gave like this, what I call baby or mini agenda at the beginning. So you told her that we have lifestyle changes, physiotherapy, and then later on surgery. And you gently commented on her way. So it's a, I liked the approach that you used. And you are you answered the patient's question on duloxetine because I told you that the patient would ask about duloxetine later on. But then when you came to the smoking, it was harsh. Don't only think that it was really harsh. I won't hear what you said that you really need to change your smoking habits. That's not a nice way to talk to a patient in a non-judgmental way. You should not be judging her for her lifestyle. Instead, you should be giving her advice. This way you would be judging her. So to give her advice, you can just tell her that. I can see that you do smoke cigarettes and smoking does upset the bladder, it meaning irritate her. It, sorry, not her, why am I saying her? So smoking does upset the bladder and um, we usually advise patients who smoke to stop smoking and that has shown to improve their symptoms. We do have NHS Stop Smoking service available. If you would like, I can give you their leaflets later on. 
So she would tell you okay, all right? But if you say in that way, she'll not listen to you. She can even tell you, who are you to tell me that I need to change or stop smoking? I can do what I want to do. You just treat what you have to treat, okay? And um, so Didi talked about the lifestyle changes. She talked about the exercises physiotherapist so she covered the colleagues part on it she then went and talked about that and sorry and the weight that the follow-up would be after three months of exercise and then we will see if you're improving you will continue on them if you're not we'll then go and discuss surgical options you just need to name the options DT. this is not the time or the station for you to give the patient the information you don't really have to spill out all the guidelines at that discussion all right um so just name them to her so you can tell her that after three uh, months if you're still wetting yourself and the exercises are not working uh we will um discuss your case or your case would be discussed in a group of um specialized doctors in situations like these or cases like these and then the most suitable surgical option would be offered to you and we will have a discussion with you ahead of time on which option you would prefer so we have three options available and then that's it you do not have to talk about details if you do if she does ask you what does the surgery involve that means she's prompting you that means that there are marks in the details but i don't think that would be the case because you just have 10 minutes to assess the patient from a to Z and talk about the initial management plan. Um, so DT, like I said, if you had not wasted that initial one minute, you would have had enough time to summarize your discussion, mention to her you'll be writing back to the GP, giving her an information leaflet, okay? And um, I asked you to talk about the bladder diary, but I didn't want Hasina to mention it, but since Hasina mentioned it, you didn't mention it, no problem. But um, the bladder diary should be able to fit in into those five minutes very comfortably. Okay, so let's go to our next scenario. So the patient now went home, started the exercises, went to the physiotherapist, went to the dietitian. She managed to drop down her BMI from 32 to 28. After four months, she goes back to her GP again. And this is the letter from the GP. Would you be kind enough to see this patient whom you diagnosed with stress urinary incontinence and instructed her on weight loss along with pelvic floor muscle training? Her BMI went down from 32 to 28. She has been doing the exercises on a regular basis as instructed for four months under the supervision of a physiotherapist. She's medically fit, has two children delivered by a cesarean section, and she has been on continuous combined HRT for the past two years. She's not allergic to any medications. Amanda has now presented to me claiming that her incontinence has not improved and would like further management. And this task, I gave it to Rishma, and I didn't want her to take any history because you would be wanting to ask a patient a few questions, but that wasn't required. I just wanted her to talk about the explanation, so, or the management plan. So I gave her seven minutes, okay? So let's hear Rishma's answers. Um, because the answer is lengthy, I'm going to pause in between while she's talking and give comments as we go on, all right? So let me get an empty piece of paper. All right. Okay, let's start. Hi, I'm Dr. Reshma, one of the senior doctors in this clinic today. May I confirm your name and age, please? I'm Amanda, 55 years. Okay, Amanda, from your GP letter, I came to know that you have urine leak when you cough and you are doing exercise and you have tried. You, you reduced your weight and you tried with pelvic floor exercises and unfortunately, no result was found. And yes, doctor. I'm so sorry that you're going through this sufferings, but I'm here to help you. I will discuss you about the surgical options. First, Amanda, I will tell you about what is your exact problem. See, this is your bladder and this is the urine carrying tube from bladder called urethra. 
okay so what is happening is why you are getting urine leaked when you do exercises is because one uh, causes you the muscles of this urine passing tube or urethra is weak so that it can't you hold urine at that time when there is increased pressure or it may be because this lower part of this urinary bladder and this urine passing tube getting descended down from its original position so that it is more mobile that two are the reasons so now i will tell okay so rishma what did she do she did introduce herself in a nice way but then um she assumed that the patient doesn't know what stress urine incontinence is she started right away explaining what stress urine incontinence is this is the second time the patient is seen she was diagnosed for four or sorry yeah four or five months ago with the stress incontinence Hasin explained to her what the stress incontinence is and now she came into because she is not improving so please don't feel that that's why I always um, say to my students that don't feel that you have to spill everything out in the station change it you are being assessed on your clinical abilities in day-to-day -day life you're not going to do that every time with the patient especially in follow-up if you're following her up you're going to explain to her again from the beginning what she has in situation like these in which you would come across a lot in the exam establish from the patient what she knows ask her ask her can you share with me what you understand about the condition that you have or can you share with me um what you understand about stress urine incontinence and then she will tell you what she knows this is a nice way to establish what the patient understands at the same time involving her with you because that's part of communication involving the patient with you as well okay but i must admit rashmi did explain the stress urine incontinence in a in a very nice way so let's come and see how she goes further the options uh, one first option is cold pus suspension so in this option what we will do is we will put a small cut in your lower tummy and uh, we will just lift this lower part of bladder called uh, bladder and the ure urine passing tube called urethra that part is called bladder neck we will lift it and we will put stitches there it can be done as an open operation or it as a laparoscopic operation laparoscopy means making small concern putting camera inside and doing the operation so you need to go, uh, you can be in the hospital for one or two days and getting discharged and out of 100 women doing this operation uh, 90 will get their symptoms relieved but remaining people can have their symptoms coming again or some people have their urine a uh, feeling like once they pass urine also they will have a feeling that some urine is remaining back or some people may develop symptoms like they want to when they wish to pass urine then itself they need to go to toilet otherwise they will pass urine wherever they are urinary incont arch incontinence it is such type of difficulties can happen and am i clear amanda yes doctor then they okay so you can see that she started talking about the first option, the copper suspension, but she went right away to talk about the surgery. Um, I usually prefer to have a baby or mini agenda like Liti did. So you do have two types of surgery. So you can tell her that since the exercises did not work or improve your symptoms, now we would offer you some surgeries and we do have two types of surgeries that I'm going to discuss with you. Okay. At any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me and I'll be happy to answer your questions. So she didn't do that part. When she came to call for suspension, Rishmi did explain it nicely in lay language, well done. Uh, you covered all the points that are needed for um, surgeries or procedures in your gynecology, meaning you tell her the name of the procedure, explain it to her, the type of incision, type of anesthesia, length of hospital stay, the success rate, any advantages if you're going to compare it to another surgical option, and then the last thing is the risks associated. So all of these have to be mentioned. Rishma did cover them really well, but I have some small comments that I wrote down. 
you said or Rishma said that it can be done op open or laparoscopically or how what would open mean open can be an up and down incision or it can be an incision above the bikini line so she has to know what kind of open so you can tell her that this procedure we usually do it through a cut just above your bikini line but um, some women choose to have it through a keyhole surgery because they wouldn't want that cut in which would be going through your belly button having two small cuts on the side and this type of surgery if you want it it would depend upon the availability of a doctor who's um expert in such procedures um the advantage of the keyhole surgery above the open one is that um your recovery would be quicker and easier and you get to go home later on the same day or the next day so this is how you talk about both of them because she has to make a choice at the end okay um you talked about the type of anesthesia well done and success 90 percent um the most important thing is that you told the patient it's not 100 percent guaranteed meaning that the symptoms can recur again later on uh, you talked about incomplete emptying of the bladder well done uh, you mentioned urging continence. Um, I don't think that urging continence is a complication of colpo suspension. I know that uh, recurrent UTIs, which are recurrent water infections, frequency, rushing, um, going to the toilet more frequent, and there's and also um, rushing to the toilet, and then there's the posterior vaginal wall prolapse. So you can tell her that um, what can happen is that there can be a bulge on the posterior wall of your vagina or on the back wall of your vagina, but it's usually not problematic and it doesn't require any treatment. So these are the risks associated with corpus suspension. Okay, so um, you asked her, am I clear before going to the next question? So that's a, um, it is a good way to invite questions, but I usually prefer that, am I clear Use it after you explain diagnosis, um, talk about investigations or examination. And then after you talk about management option, you want to see if she has any questions. So am I clear so far is a yes or no answer. You can tell me yes, you're clear or no, you're not clear. And you would then repeat. But if you ask her, do you have any questions? She can then tell you, um, are there any drugs that I can take? All right. Oh, I have heard that there's another procedure in which you would just put some injections lower down. I've read about that. So here you open the door for her by asking that question. Do you have any questions so far? So she can prompt you and guide you. Because if she asks a question like that, even if it's not a recommended management right now, answer her right away because there are marks in that um, scenario. So Rishma always use, um, do you have any questions so far to have that door open for the patient? Let's come to the next option. The next that option need. is a uh, sling operation. That is, uh, we are making small, after putting you to sleep, first operation called corpo suspension also, we will do after putting you to sleep. And the second operation, what I am going to tell, sling operation also, after putting you to sleep, we will make small cut in your lower tummy and in upper part of vagina and we will introduce inside a ribbon-like thing hmm, called a sling. And that with that we will we, that we will place around your urine passing tube called urethra to strengthen it. But the problem with this is that uh, from where we will get this tissue, either from your tummy muscle or from an another person. If you are using the one from another person, it will definitely will have tissue reaction, can get infected or it may have similar problems as I told. Like you may have a feeling of incomplete urine emptying and out of 100 women undergone this procedure, 90 will have symptom relief. 10, 10 people out of 100 can have repeating of their symptoms. After this operation, next day you can get discharged. and. And third option is, uh, instead of this tissue from your tummy muscle, we can take a mesh. This is synthetic material. Similarly, making a small cut in your lower tummy after putting you to sleep, making small cut in your lower tummy and upper vagina, we can place this 
But the problem with the mesh is that that will we do when other options are not successful and that too this mesh, mesh can migrate, move from the placed area to your urinary bladder or your mouth bowel and it can create problems. So that we will use that with caution. So these are the options Amanda is doctor and which one we will do in your case will be decided by a group of specialist doctors called multidisciplinary team. I will write in detail about your case and we will send it to them for their opinion and my consultant will see you also and then they will decide and that multidisciplinary team my consultant and urologist will be there and they will decide and if you have any preferences I can write that also. Okay Amanda and then apart from all Okay, so let's pause here and then we'll continue. Um, Rishma, you talked about the sling procedure, but then I don't know why you divided it into um, autologous facial sling and then a mesh. Because um, as a patient, I think she would understand that these are totally different procedures. At the end, they're the same. It's just the material that you're using is different, but the type of anesthesia like the hospital say all of that uh, is the same so combine them together don't make them three options make them two options the corpus suspension and then the sling and mention the sling can either be this or that okay um you talked about the length of hospital stay well done uh type of incision as well so you can tell her that you won't be having any major cuts on your tummy but it will be done through your vagina sometimes a small cut would be done on your lower tummy if it's needed but it would be very small um, and you talked about the risks associated and the success rate 90 percent uh, but then I realized that the success you included it within the risk you usually talk about the success at the beginning finish from it and then separate it from the risk of the procedure um, you mentioned that I've written here we do it the mesh you do it when others other options are not su not successful sorry um, that's wrong you're giving her wrong information according to the guideline the recent one either colpo suspension or um, sling procedure autologous facial one or a mesh one these three are equal not there's not one preferred over the other it would depend upon the choice of the patient after she's fully informed about what she can expect, what are the risks, what are the success rates, okay? So don't say something according to what you think, never. Just say it according to the guideline. And when you talk about the risk of um, the mesh, the most important thing that you have to mention is erosion. So when, when you talk about erosion, you can tell her that this tape, uh, the only problem with it, that in the long run, it may rub into your vagina or your water pipe and it will cause extreme pain. And the only way to treat it is to remove that tape and operation like that can be extremely difficult. It's uncertain whether it would happen or not, but that's a risk that you have to know about. So that's the most important thing she has to know. And uh, when you come and talk to her about um, the sling, you just like, like you said, like a ribbon. So for that ribbon, we can either use a muscle from your own body or we can bring a mesh, which is something artificial or a foreign body, to use it as a ribbon. Both of them have the same effect and success. They just differ in the side effects. So there's an additional risk that can happen with the mesh, which is, and you talk about the erosion, but then you combine all the risks together, okay, of these two, just to not to waste time. You then talked about the local MDT before the operation. You talked about the people involved, well done. And you gave reference to your consultant. So that these are colleagues and you did show that you know your limit as an SD5. You're just here to counsel the patient about her options. Later on, the decision would depend upon the senior. So let's go on with the rest of your recording. One more option available for you is injecting uh, a substance into the urine passing tube. That substance is called bulking agent. So that your urine passing tube will get swells up so that it can hold urine. Urethra will swells up and it can hold urine in a better way. But the problem is so that no need of cutting. So that your recovery will be faster. Same day you can go and we will do it after putting you to sleep and introducing.
using a small camera through your wind passing area, we will do it. But the problem is effectiveness is not that much. Out of 100 women, only 70 women will find relief with this. And as the days goes by, after a few months, you may require a repeat injection as well. But the injections are safe only. But that is the disadvantage with this. If all this four is not working, next option available will be keeping an artificial urethral sphincter. That is one extra muscle like thing we are keeping to give additional strength to your passing tube. But that is the last resort that require a little more bigger surgery by putting a small cut in your lower tummy and the upper vagina. We are keeping a cuff, a two cuffs will, cuff, cuff will be there. One at uh, this urethral area and one in your lower tummy. And uh, once if you want to pass urine, we need to press up on that and all. That is the last option. And one more final option, if nothing is working, is diverting your urine carrying tube from kidney to bubble instead of urinary bladder. So that that uh, is the last option and uh, so that you will pass urine through your motion passing area only. But a lot of infection risk and all is there. So that we will not routinely do. And I can provide you with patient information if that. And I will arrange an appointment with my consultant. Okay. Rishma, what you just mentioned right now, it's not relevant. I think it's a complete waste of time. You talked about bulking agents. Um, you told her as this is an option available, but the guideline says it's available if she refuses one of the first two. And you, you didn't make it sound like that. And that can really affect your applied clinical knowledge. Um, I don't understand because you don't, you don't have a patient in front of you. You're just doing it alone. No give and take. That part of communication is not there. But um, if the patient did tell you, is there any other option apart from surgery? I don't really um want surgery then you would talk about the bulk changes but if she says nothing do not bring that option at all please don't you then went on further and talked about extreme surgical options later on you already gave her information about two types of surgeries in detail you're just going to confuse her more by giving her detailed information as well about further surgical plans if these fails. Finish from what's happening now and then go uh, to the other options later on if it does fail, okay? Or if her symptoms come back again. So the sphincters and all of that, no need to talk about them. You can just tell her that um, if after surgery like this, your symptoms do come back again or it doesn't work, then we have further more um, what can I say? Um, I don't want to say complicated. Furthermore, uh, major surgeries than this, okay? But do not mention any details. And like I said, you don't, you don't have to mention all the guideline in, in um, counseling. You could have used that remaining time that you had, instead of talking about bulking agents and talking about um, further surgery later on, um, that her data will be entered into the National Registry of Incontinence. The guideline mentioned that the patient has to know that her personal data would be used there because um, if you're going to use any personal data like the name, the NHS number, in, in something outside the hospital, the patient has to know and you have to take her consent. So she has to know about that if she goes for any other surgical procedures and that after any other surgical procedures, she will have she will be followed up for um, right here for six months, okay? Um, writing back to the GP and summarizing the discussion. You could have done all of that. You did have time to give a leaflet, but these are more important points than extreme surgery later on. You never know what's going to happen in the future, unless the patient asks you, of course, and tells you, what if my symptoms come back again? Um, are there anything is there anything different that can that I can have then at that situation you tell her yes there are more um, advanced or extreme surgeries than this but to be honest 
and the information that you mentioned about the Balkan Indian is very nice. Okay, uh, well done. And um, what do I want to say again? All right, um, I don't have any other further comments. These are my comments. So please, Asia, Hasina, Diti, and Mishma, go on work on the points that I corrected you on and apply the same information that I gave you to every other station that you come through. Okay, thank you everyone. I hope all of you enjoyed uh, the feedback and the case. I know it's lengthy, around about uh, four to five or 50 minutes, but I can't help myself but explain. So I'll see you next time in the other video, all right? Bye.